let, uh, let, us, uh, let us begin with, uh, with considering uh, Basil of Caesarea. Um, so uh, Basil is um, one of the, the great church fathers uh, who is also associated with uh, the Cappadocians, right? We weren't, didn't have time to cover them, uh, but they were a movement, a monastic movement, um, and they, uh, there's, there's a few of the church fathers that popped up out of the Cappadocians. So you have Basil the Great, you have uh, Gregory Nys- Nyssa, and uh, Gregory and, of Na- Nazianzus. And uh, these, these three men were instrumental in uh, pastoral theology, uh, in, the sp- in the pneumatology of the, of the scriptures, and um, <clears throat> especially Basil, as, we'll, as we will see today. Um, so you remember that the Council of Nicaea, um, <clears throat> what did the Council of Nicaea do for the church? What did it affirm? The, the biggest idea. Yeah, the deity of Christ, right? Uh, that, that Christ was homoousios with the Father. <clears throat> um, what, uh, then, then Arianism, of course, railed against Nicaea for all those years that we saw last uh, yesterday. Um, but what was lacking in the Council of Nicaea was uh, the question of, um, so we affirm the Son is, the, is homoousios with the Father, but what about the Holy Spirit? And perhaps because of the many battles with the Arians, uh, this topic was still left to be developed. And the man that we owe um, a, the bulk of, although, the, you know, like we saw with Origen, we saw with other men who referred to the Holy Spirit as being uh, of God and, and, and of the same essence of God, <clears throat> the, the person who really took this as their life goal and their life pas- passion was Basil of Caesarea, and uh, especially in his, book, in his book on the Holy Spirit, um, he uh, develops this idea and lays the groundwork, which would be for the council of what? That's right, Constantinople. <clears throat> which would be in 381... And here they would reaffirm homoousios, but they would also include the Holy Spirit as proceeding from the Father and being eternal in nature. So, Basil died before the Council of Constantinople. Um, He was not in attendance uh, with it, um, but his work laid the groundwork for it. uh, No question about it. Um, Similar to Athanasius' work in defending uh, Nicene Orthodoxy. Uh, he never lived to see the Council of Constantinople uh, do away with Arianism, uh, but his, though he was not present at the council, uh, his fingerprints were all over the hearts of the men who were there doing the work. Um, <clears throat> Basil was born in Caesarea in 330. And... Um, he was born into a uh, Christian family um, whose, uh, whose family had a history of having multiple martyrs um, in it, his grandparents, um, other, other, other family members. So his family was a very uh, multi-generational Christian family, faithful, strong. Um, <clears throat> Basil desi- des- desired to study uh, philosophy and rhetoric, and so in 350... He moved to Athens to study these things and um, uh, decided that he didn't much like uh, the study. He got very frustrated with it. So five years later, 355 or 356, he moved back home. And it was at this time that his sister, Macrina, convinced him that the reason why he was not satisfied with his studies in Athens was because he was meant to study and do something else with his life. And that was that he was meant to follow God and devote his life to serving God. And that is what he, by the, by the discipleship of his sister, uh, that is what he decides to do. And this is what he talks about his early years. I wasted nearly all my youth in the vain labor that occupied me in the acquisition of the teachings of that wisdom which God has made foolish. 
Then at last, as if roused from a deep sleep, I looked at the wonderful light of the truth of the gospel. And I perceived the worthlessness of the wisdom of the rulers of this age who are doomed to destruction. After I had mourned deeply from my miserable life, I prayed that guidance be given to me for my introduction to the precepts of piety. So, uh, what, uh, he was then baptized. And uh, what, what Basil wanted to do, well, which is what a lot of the young men who wanted to study the scriptures wanted to do back then, was he wanted to become a monk. Um, so he took a tour of the uh, monastic, uh, the monastics, and uh, uh, wanted to see what it was like. Basil left for a tour of the ascetic communities of Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, many of which, at first glance, appeared to have impressed him deeply. We find him writing such phrases as, I admired, I was amazed, and all this moved my admiration. But Basil noticed something uh, lacking from um, anchorite, remember anchorite, the difference between anchorite and, cen- and cenobite monasticism? Anchorite is individualistic, right? Uh, more, more in solitude. Um, he noticed something deeply lacking um, with, with that type of monasticism. And um, the, what was lacking was how can a Christian obey the law of love and be isolated? So he desired to be a monk, but he also desired uh, to fulfill the law of Christ. And he wrote this <clears throat> about uh, being, a, being a monastic. How will he show his humility if there is no one with whom he may compare and so confirm his own greater humility? How will he give evidence of his compassion if he has cut himself off from the association with other persons? And how will he exercise himself in long suffering if no one contradicts his wishes? Right? So this is uh, a argument that we are meant to live in community together as Christians uh, because um, we are different and we are able to uh, knock the rough edges off of each other in a way that God has designed for it to happen. And being on your own, you do not receive that level of sanctification. So uh, he decided to join the uh, familial monastery with his uh, his family, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, and Macrina, and they emphasized prayer and singing in their, uh, their duties as um, the monastics. And they also, or Basil, and they, they also all did their other, other things too, but Basil then also began to form and found um, other monasteries uh, for people to go to, and um, this uh, caused him to write what is called the shorter and the longer rules for monastic life. So he was uh, trying to make, trying to figure out a way to make it easy for other men to build these types of monasteries, which were able to emphasize the study and the dedication to God, but then also able to uh, give a community of love for people to live into. Um, <clears throat> one of Basil's main emphasis in his theology, is um, on, on humility. And uh, I think it's in, yeah, it's in Haken that he uh, gives a, um, he gives a um, extended treatment of Basil's homily, Basil's 20th homily that is on humility. So we're going to walk through that a little bit. Would that man had abided in the glory which he possessed in God, He would have genuine instead of fictitious dignity, for he would be ennobled by the power of God, illumined with divine wisdom, and made joyful in the possession of eternal life and its blessings. But because he ceased to desire divine glory in expectation of a better prize and strove for the untainable, he lost the good which it was in his own power to possess. What he's teaching is uh, the idea of humility is not was not a it was not at all common. Or popular with uh, with a Greek philosophy and Greek uh, Greek or, or rhetoric, and what he is developing is because no one wants to be humble, right? Who wants to be humble? And what he's teaching is that mankind, in its humble form, was actually the most lifted up that mankind would be, because in its in mankind's humble form before God. We were receiving the divine wisdom of God. We were imaging his image forth. So it's when mankind decided to try to be more than what they were intended to be that they actually faced 
a worse form of humility, humility than humility, and that is pride. Does that make sense? So the pride, the proudness of man is much more degrading than the humility of God, is what Basil's teaching. <clears throat> because he'd ceased to desire divine glory and expectation of a better prize and strove for the unattainable, he lost the good which it was in his power to possess. The surest salvation for him, for him the remedy of his ills, and the means of restoration to his original state is in practicing humility and not pretending that he may lay claim to any glory through his own efforts, but seeking it from God. Therefore, you should humble yourself and receive the glory of God. But what is true glory and what makes a man great? In this, says the prophet, let him that glories glory that he understands and knows that I am the Lord. This constitutes the highest dignity of man. This is his glory and greatness. Truly to know what is great and to cleave to it and to seek after glory from the Lord of glory. The apostle tells us, he that glories may glory in the Lord, saying Christ was made for us a wisdom of God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, is, that as it is written, he that glories may glory in the Lord. Do you see where they're just compiling scripture references now? This is what they, yeah, this is what they're doing. Now, that is the perfect and consummate glory in God, not to exult in one's own righteousness, but recognizing oneself as lacking true righteousness to be justified by faith in Christ alone. <clears throat> so he, he exhorts his listeners to look away from yourself to God and don't look to anything that you have that might be valuable or good either. Why do you glory in your goods as if, they're, if, as if they were your own instead of giving thanks to the giver for his gifts? So one, one way that mankind is, uh, struggles to be humble is they, they, look, they look around at all the things that they have, right? And they say, well, I, 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 have very many, I have a lot of resources. I have a lot of valuables. And Basil's argument is, well, you, have not, you don't have anything that you have not been given, right? So why are you being proud about it? And this is what Paul is arguing, right? Uh, for what do you have, he's quote, quoting 1 Corinthians here, for what do you have that you have not received? And if you received, why do you glory as if you have, had not received it? You have not known God by reason of your righteousness, but God has known you by reason of his goodness. After that, you have known God, says the apostle, or rather, are known by God. You did not apprehend Christ because of your virtue, but Christ apprehended you by his coming. You did not apprehend Christ by your virtue, but Christ has apprehended you by his coming. That sounds like Athanasius, right? What we looked at last night. <clears throat> Therefore, look to Christ for an example. In everything which concerns the Lord, we find lessons in humility. As an infant, he was straightway laid in a cave, and not upon a couch, but in a manger, in the house of a carpenter. Uh, so the, the, the point is, is that Christ came as a man to show us what men are to be like before God. And that is humble. Right? So in his human nature, he humbled himself, taking on the form of a man, of flesh, and uh, humbling himself even to the point of death. Therefore, we should follow his example, which is what Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, in Philippians 2. <clears throat> um, in the house of a carpenter and of a mother who was poor, he was subject to his mother and her spouse. He was taught and he paid heed to what he needed to be told, or not to be told, he asked questions, but even in the asking, he won admiration for his wisdom. He submitted to John. The Lord received baptism at the hands of his servant. He did not make use of the marvelous power that he possessed to re resist any of those who attacked him. But as if yielding to superior force, he allowed temporal authority to exercise the power proper to it. He was brought before the high priest as though a criminal and then led to the governor. He bore uh, uh, calamity, uh, calumnies in silence and submitted to his sentence although he could have refuted the false witness. He was, uh, hmm, I'm not sure what that, that's a typo upon slaves. Spat, spat, yeah, he was spat on, thank you, spat upon by slaves and by the vilest menials. He delivered himself up to death, the most shameful death known to men. Thus, from his birth to the end of his life, he experienced all the exigencies that befall mankind, and after displaying humility to such a degree, he manifested his glory associating him with himself in glory, those who shared his, his disgrace. 
So who follow after the humility of Christ will also share in his glory. And Basil knows that this is not an easy thing. So you need to, you need to struggle with it daily. Your manner of speaking and singing, your conversation with your neighbor also should aim at modesty rather than pretentiousness. Do not strive, I beg you, for artificial embellishment in speech, for coying sweetness in song, or for a high-flown style in conversation. In all your actions, be free from pomp- pompicity. Um, this is really accurate, uh, helpful for pastors. Okay? Um, I think sometimes we as pastors can get caught up in trying to say things uh, that, that make, make people impressed with what we're saying. Um, now, there's a difference between what he's talking about and what we're going to talk about with Augustine, who said things very beautifully, but also very simply. But um, I think we all know when someone is trying to impress people with the way that they talk. And uh, uh, when we do that as pastors, we are losing the point of why we should speak. We should not speak to make ourselves look good, but to make God look good to them, right? God be revealed to them. So humility in your preaching is a very valuable asset. Okay, and it's especially incumbent upon leaders to live this life of humility. Suppose you have been deemed worthy of the episcopate, and men throng about you and hold you in esteem. Come down to the level of your subordinates, not as lording it over the clergy, and do not behave as worldly worldly, uh, potentates do. The Lord bade him who wishes to be first to be the servant of all. Right? So, as pastors, we're the first servants. Right? And, and, and who, who was the first servant of all before we were? Christ. Christ. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat> Conclusion of the sermon. Strive for the glory with God, for his is a glorious reward. Strive after humility as becomes a lover of this virtue. Love it, and it will glorify you. See, isn't that kind of cool? Love humility, and it will glorify you, right? Returning you back to the, the humility of God is, is, a, is a higher estate than the proudness of mankind. Then you will travel to good purpose, the road leading to that true glory, which is to be found with the angels and with God. Christ will acknowledge you as his own disciple before the angels, and he will glorify you if you imitate his humility. Okay, any thoughts or questions on his homily? And, and these, all these quotes are in your Haken. They're all in here. So this is, he, he works through his homily, and um, I just pulled a few of the quotes that he pulls out and added my own thoughts. So if you liked any of those, they're all, they're all in there. <clears throat> okay. On the Holy Spirit. Um, so this book... If you decide to do your paper on Basil, this book would be worth reading. Um, it's not very long, um, and it is full of wisdom and uh, just an amazing theology of the Holy Spirit that laid the foundation, as I've said, uh, for what the church would then adopt um, in the Council of Constantinople. Um, <clears throat> the, the preface to it um, was that uh, Basil was corresponding with a friend um, who was uh, denying the uh, the denying the deity of the spirit. And um, uh, he actually ended up getting his friend uh, to sign a statement that says that he affirmed the deity of the Holy Spirit, but then quickly after that, recounted that aff- recount, recanted that affirmation. And uh, this grieved Basil uh, severely. And so he decided that a work must be written uh, to help the church understand uh, the holiness, uh, or in the, the holiness, the, the deity of the Holy Spirit. And this work was written in 375. <clears throat> and it laid the groundwork for the church to, def- to deify the Holy Spirit properly at the Council of Constantinople. Um, <clears throat> this is an extended quote. But it's a, uh, what, what Haken says is that it may have been a, um, a meditation of the Holy Spirit, 
that Basil includes as his, uh, as his introduction to the book. Um, it's on page 123 of Haken. I'll read it for you. The Holy Spirit lives not because he is endowed with life, but because he is the giver of life, the source of sanctification. Now the relationship existing between the Spirit and our souls is not one of local proximity, for how can you bodily-wise draw near to the incorporeal? But it consists in the forsaking of lust, which fostered by the love of the flesh, fastened onto the soul and alienated from the fellowship with God. Hence, it is only by being purified from shame, the stain incurred through wickedness, and by returning to our natural beauty, and as it were, by cleansing and restoring the king's image, that we can approach the paraclete. And he, like the sun, where your sight is purged, will show you in himself the image of the invisible. And in the blessed vision of the image, you shall see the ineffable beauty of the archetype. Through him, hearts are lifted up, and the weak are taken by the hand. Those advancing are perfected. He shedding his bright beams upon those who are cleansed from every stain make, makes them spiritual by their communion with himself. And as clear, transparent bodies of a ray of light falls upon them, becoming radiant to themselves and diffuse their splendor all around, so souls, illuminated by the indwelling of the Spirit, are rendered spiritual themselves and impart their grace to others. So when you are a, spirit, a spiritual person, you then do what the Spirit did, which is then impart goodness to others. Then comes the knowledge of the future, the understanding of mysteries, the comprehension of secrets, the distribution of gifts, the heavenly life, companionship with angels, unending joy, abiding in God, likeness to God, and utmost of our heart's desires, the being God. Such in brief are the views which we have had been taught by the oracles of the Spirit themselves to hold, respecting the greatness, the dignity, and the operations of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, friends with the angels, in the presence of the angels. That, that's what we look forward to. Yeah. Yep. Um, so his argument is, is because of being is so powerful to do these things in us, he can only be what? God. Yes. So that's, that's, his, that's his preface, right? That's his introduction uh, to his argument on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> And, 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 and his second argument, then, is that we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're baptized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we cannot worship God without worshiping the Holy Spirit. In worship, the Holy Spirit is inseparable from the Father and the Son. For disassociated from Him, you will not worship at all. And you not only worship Him in there, but you worship by His power. But being in Him, you cannot by any means separate Him from God any more that you can sever the light from the thing seen. For it is impossible to see the image of God except by the illumination of the Spirit. So he is your vision, your eyes, your light. He's showing you these things. And he who gazes upon the image cannot sever the light from the, from the image. For the, the cause of vision is of necessity seen together with the things we see. So then, through the illumination of the Spirit, we behold the eff effulgence of the glory of God. And through the, that... Impress, through the impress, we are led up to him of whom he is the impress and exact representation. So he's our bridge to the Father. And when he, the Spirit comes to rest in you, he brings new life. Therefore, we never divorce the paraclete from his unity with the Father and the Son. For our mind, when it is lit by the Spirit, looks up to the Son, and in him, as in an image, beholds the Father. Oh, this is where it talks about life. The Spirit of God is given to the true saints to dwell in them as his proper lasting abode. And he is represented as being there so united to the faculties of the soul that he becomes there a principle of spring of new nature and life. The light of the sun of righteousness doesn't only shine upon them, but is so communicated to them that they shine also and become little images of that sun which shines upon them. Um... Basil dies in 379. Um, he, he had a lifelong uh, bout of, of many different illnesses and um, had not seen the groundwork of the Spirit uh, come to fruition in the church. Um, but uh, it's undoubted that the men who were speaking the words of the deity of the Holy Spirit were very much influenced by the work of the great Cappadocian.
Thoughts or questions? Yeah, they, uh, they were evangelistic in that people like to hear what they say, and uh, they would come to them. But they would also seek people to, to come into the monasteries with them. But I would definitely say that the, the, the majority of the evangelism was happening within the church. And these, these monasteries weren't, weren't really seeing themselves as missionaries, but more uh, teachers or meditators on the scriptures. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so you suppose, you know, what maybe one of you will end up uh, spending the majority of his life teaching at a college. You know, being a, being a resident and teaching at the college. Teaching at a college, you know, teaching people. That, that, is, that could be what we understand to be uh, the monastic living. Now, there's, there's more to it than that, but that is the type of thing. So you're not a missionary, you're not a pastor. You're, you're training. You're, your job is to study and to train, yeah. which is a good calling. We need those kinds of people. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the church knows that. Yeah, for sure. Just like it's not everyone to be a pastor, you know. <clears throat> Anything else? Um, <clears throat> Gregory of Nazianzus wrote a uh, book on pastoral rule as well. Um, uh, we just did not have time to talk about it, uh, but it is um, excellent as well. And his sermons are also very good, um, but they're, some of them are in here. But if you guys wanted to do, if you guys wanted to do your thing on the Cappadocians, um, you should talk. You should look into Gregory of Nazianzus as well. Anything else? All right. Um, let's just shoot right over and get into. Let's see who's next. Ambrose. Ambrose was born in 339 into a Christian family. This is where we start to see some second-generation Christians popping up, second and third generation. Um, of all the bishops we've looked at, um, Ambrose by far has the most dramatic career as a bishop. Um, he was not a bishop, but he was the governor of Milan. And there arose a dispute of um, uh, between who would take upon themselves the bishop of Milan. The Arians and the Orthodox were arguing over who should be the next bishop when their bishop had died. And um, it is said that they, their arguments became so drastic that Ambrose was feared that a riot would break out in the city of Milan. So he came to them and spoke so eloquently. He was trained in rhetoric. He spoke so eloquently uh, to calm them down that as, as he was speaking to them simply to calm them down, they began to cry out, Ambrose should be the bishop. Ambrose should be the bishop from Arian and, uh, and Orthodox alike. And Ambrose did not want to be the bishop, uh, so he tried to flee Milan, and they did not let him flee Milan, so they made him the bishop. And he was not even baptized yet. So he is a bishop, and he has not been catechumenized or, ba or, or baptized into the church. <clears throat> Since he was only a catechumen, hadn't finished it yet, and therefore was not even baptized, it was necessary to perform that rite and then to raise him through the various levels of the ministerial orders. So they had to catechize him, baptize him, raise him through the ranks of the presbytery, and that all happened in eight days. And he was then concentrated, the Bishop of Milan, on December 1st, 373. What would that look like? <laughs> oh, so, you know... Um, in America, uh, I'm not sure. You know, even with Sovereign Grace too, um, you know, it's it's very it's very common uh, for uh, someone who has studied the Scriptures to go to what is called um, a seminary to take a further education, and then they will sometimes t take an internship in a church, 
um, for a couple of years, and then there'll be somewhat of an assistant pastor, and then there'll be, a, you know, a lead pastor. And then, so, so these are the ranks that he's going through. And then, you know, from there, a lead pastor will then be some sort of overseer pastor of, of many churches, right? Um, and uh, so he went from not even a member of a church to the overseer of many churches within eight days. Yeah. They just wanted him as bishop. They weren't, he wasn't, you know, it wasn't actually technically qualified, but he was, uh, they just, they really wanted him to be bishop. He was in a Christian family. He was trained in rhetoric, but he was going to need, uh, need some assistance. And there was a man uh, who came alongside him uh, to, to guide him in, in, his, in, in his calling now. That same man would actually uh, also guide Augustine in his, uh, in his struggle uh, to be, to be, uh, um, to be uh, obedient to God. Um, but there's no doubt that, the, that Ambrose as a bishop uh, will go down as one of the greatest bishops we've ever had in the church. And what does this teach us about human, uh, human uh, capabilities or human uh, qualifications? They're not really that important, right? You know, God can take a man. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to school. I'm not saying you shouldn't do these things. I'm not saying you shouldn't give yourself to these things. But when you feel overwhelmed or inequipped in the ministry, and you will, you have to remember that God was able to equip Ambrose in eight days to be bishop and to be bishop well. So it's not really about us. <clears throat> not only... Not only um, did he become a very gifted preacher and a very extremely gifted preacher and a very capable theologian, um, he was also uh, of great influence uh, to Augustine. <clears throat> um, Ambrose was also uh, very staunch and courageous. So uh, we've seen courage in many of these men, but Ambrose uh, is rivaled by none. Um, so we remember who Theodosius is, right? <clears throat> He's the last emperor of the United Roman Empire. Yes, and then he also called the Council of Constantinople. There's an account that um, uh, <clears throat> uh, there was um, an account that in Thessalonica, a city under the rule of Theodosius, there was a riot that broke out. And um, the riot, the, the rioters ended up killing one of the generals in the army during the riot. And uh, Theodosius' anger burned against the rioters, and he wanted uh, to punish them. And uh, Ambrose, being a friend of Theodosius, comes to him and says, you need to exercise grace and patience. I'm not saying you shouldn't judge them, but be patient with them. Okay, um, so Theodosius agrees to be patient with them and writes a, a, writes a letter of pardon to the people of Thessalonica. And upon receiving the pardon of the letter of pardon, they decide to throw a party in Thessalonica to rejoice the fact that they were not going to be killed by the emperor. And it was at that time that the emperor... Theodosius, knowing who all were rejoicing at the pardon, rounded all of them up and killed 7,000 uh, killed 7,000 Thessalonians. <clears throat> so he tricked them, and um, Ambrose was very unhappy with Theodosius. <clears throat> and it was later that Theodosius came to Milan and came to the church of Ambrose and was going to come in and take communion with Ambrose, because he very much appreciated Ambrose's ministry, where Ambrose met him at the door of the church and said this, Stop! A man such as you... He's talking to the emperor, who just killed 7,000 people. A man such as you, stained with sin, whose hands are bathed in the blood of injustice, is unworthy until he repents to enter holy place and partake of communion. 
Amen. And Theodosius' soldiers were ready to kill Ambrose, and Theodosius himself was humbled and repented of his actions and uh, was convicted at the words of the courageous bishop, and their relationship was rekindled upon his repentance. And it was when Theodosius, the emperor, <clears throat> was on his deathbed that he called for a bishop to come to be near him when he was to die, and that bishop was Ambrose. So you're going you're gonna to see people in your life. I mean, you won't, probably won't come face-to-face -face with someone who has killed 7,000 people, but you are going to come face-to-face -face with people who have, have done egregiously terrible things and are living in unrepentance. And it's going to be your temptation to be soft with them because it'll be easier for you. But we cannot. We have to be willing to say the hard word like Ambrose was willing. No matter what will happen to us. Ambrose, you think Ambrose didn't know that I could just, he could just kill me right now? He could, just, he could kill me and he could kill everybody in this church right now, right? Didn't stop him from, uh, <coughs> from speaking the truth. Ambrose died on April 4th, 397. Four, four, three ninety-seven, which was Easter, Easter Sunday. Um, <clears throat> Ambrose wrote <clears throat> um, extensively after he became bishop. Um, he wrote on the duties of the clergy, and these are extensive books on how to pastoral effectively. From them, uh, we will pull a few principles. Uh, how how a pre how a preacher ought to speak, because he famously used his mouth to stop the emperor. Let there be a door to thy mouth, that it may be shut when need arises, and let it be carefully barred, that none may rouse thy voice to anger, and thou pay back abuse with abuse. So, one of the and you'll see this with Gregory actually. One of the <clears throat> hardest parts about being a pastor is knowing when to speak, and when not to speak, and when to speak boldly, and when to be soft, in a good way, compassionate, right? <clears throat> Thou hast heard it read today, be angry and do not sin. Therefore, although we are angry, this arising from the motions of our nature, not of our will, let us not utter with our mouth one evil word, lest we fall into sin. But let there be a yoke and a balance of thy words, that is, humility and moderation, that thy tongue may be subject to thy mind. Let it be held in check with a tight rein, let it have its own means of restraint, whereby it can be recalled to, into moderation. Let it utter words tried by the scales of justice, that there may be seriousness in our meaning, weight in our speech, and due measure in our words. Uh, which is reminding us of James, the book of James, right? Uh, you know, the tongue is a fire, boasts of great things. It can uh, do great good, but it can also burn everything to the ground. Um, so when you, when you make your profession or your calling in life, one where you predominantly are using your mouth, right, to talk, it would be wise for you to heed the words of Ambrose. <clears throat> um, these are both really uh, applicable to his account with, uh, to his account with, uh, with Theodosius. Um, he says that a pastor should never allow uh, the, the friendship of somebody to stop them from calling them to virtue. Nothing, then, must be set before virtue, and that it may never be set aside by the desire for friendship. So, you know, you're going to be friends with people that you're going to have to confront. You're going to have to. And you cannot allow your desire for their friendship to set aside the desire for virtue. Scripture also gives us warning on the subject of friendship. There are indeed various questions raised among philosophers, for instance, whether a man ought for the sake of a friend to plot against his country or not, or, or to serve his friend, whether it is right to break one's faith and so aid and maintain a friend's advantage. And, of course, the answer is that it is not right to do that. He also wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, building off of the foundation of Basil, uh, and he was, um, he was at the Council of Constantinople, um, says this, but it is equal irreverence to detract from the dignity of the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. 
For he believes not in the Father who does not believe in the Son, nor does he believe in the Son of God who does not believe in the Spirit. Nor can faith stand without the rule of truth. For he who has begun to deny the, open, the oneness of power in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit certainly cannot prove his divided faith in points where there is no division. So then, since complete piety is to believe rightly, so complete impiety is to believe wrongly. It matters what we think, right? It matters. <clears throat> he wrote a book called, oh, oh yeah, he wrote a book called The Exposition of the Christian Faith, uh, which was written to uh, Gratian uh, to defend the Christian faith and to explain the Christian faith. Once again, it's very lengthy. Um, he wrote many letters to people, and then he wrote a book called On Repentance. And uh, this is the book where um, <clears throat> uh, it was in response to uh, the Novation heresy, which, which would not allow the lapsed back into the... Uh, I'm sorry, not the Novation heresy, the Novation schism, which would not allow the lapsed back into the church. And he wrote a book on repentance, teaching that the power of repentance ought to compel us to bring them back into the church. Does that make sense? Okay, so I have a few thoughts from, the, from his book on repentance. Um, books one and two was written in response to the Novation uh, Schism, which stated that the laps were not to be re-emitted. Um, Novatus of Carthage and Novation of Rome. Chapter one, uh, Ambrose begins by talking about compassion and the birth of the church. Moreover, it is, only, it is the only virtue, compassion of God, which has led to the increase of the church, which the Lord sought at the price of his own blood, imitating the loving kindness of heaven. So this is how we are to approach compassion and, and, and bringing men to repentance. Um, imitating the loving kindness of heaven and aiming at the redemption of all seeks this end with a gentleness which the ears of men can endure, in presence of which their hearts do not sink nor their spirits quail. Um, they, they think by keeping people from repentance that they are holding fast to the purity of the church, but they are not acting as God has acted. They affirm that they are showing great reverence for God, to whom alone they reserve the power of forgiving sins. So they say, we are honoring God in this way, but in truth none do him greater injury than they choose to prune his commandments and, and reject the office entrusted to them. For inasmuch as the Lord Jesus himself said in the gospel, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, whatsoever sins ye forgive, they are forgiven unto them. And whosoever, ye, whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Who, who is it that honors him most? He who obeys his bidding or he who rejects it? So what has God taught us to do? Accept repentance, right, from people. And they say we're honoring God and keeping these ones out. But Abrambro says that you are actually rejecting God. Christ has paid for these sins, right? So that your father is condemned by your own sentence. Must be their, their, their novation, Father. Who can make a distinction between sins, some of which you consider that you can loose, and some, uh, some which you consider to be without remedy. So he's saying <clears throat> that you'll forgive other sins, but there are sins that you are categorizing as not being able to be forgiven. But God does not make a distinction. Who has promised his mercy to all and granted to his priests the power of loosing without any exception? What then shall we say to this, except that which the apostle said, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, how has he not also with him given us all things? Who shall lay a change upon the elect? It is God who justifieth. Who is, that, who is he that shall condemn? It is Christ who died, yeah, who also rose again, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Novation then brings charges against those whom Christ intercedes. Those whom Christ has redeemed unto salvation, novation contains, condemns to death. Those to whom Christ says, take, not, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle. Novation says, I am not gentle. On those to whom Christ says, ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is pleasant, my burden is light. Novation lays a heavy burden and a hard yoke. Uh, the rest of the book um, are arguments from the scripture that support this thesis, of, among which are the prodigal son, the Good Samaritan, and the woman who washed Jesus' feet, and many other arguments. Um, now, we just saw a duality of the, of the person of Ambrose, right? He refused 
to let someone come into the church to take communion. Why? Because he was sinful, right? And then he also stresses that pastors should be seeking their repentance. So just as you are vigilant to purify the church and keep from it people who are sinful, right? Uh, people who are uh, not repenting in their sins, I should say, just as, just as we should be vigilant to, to be bold like, a, like Ambrose was, he, he was also bold to pursue their repentance. So we cannot be one or the other. We have to be defending the church and also drastically offensive for the church, right? So we're not to let people in who are unrepentant. And we are, uh, we are, to, be, we are to be careful to make sure that they are keeping the fruits of repentance, right? That the repentance is true repentance, and that is more difficult than what you probably imagine how difficult that is. Um, but that is the calling of the pastor, and uh, we are to balance these things um, and, 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 uh, as, as Ambrose did.